Uh, good morning, LinkedIn, and everybody watching. Um, I'm Graham Hawkins, CEO and founder of Sales Tribe, and I'm here again this morning for interview number two with uh, leading teams, Mr. Daniel Healy, um, partner and director in the leading teams company. Welcome, Daniel. Graham, great to be back, and, and great to hear such positive feedback about number one. We're back again. Yeah, look, um, really great response for the the first interview. I think the um, the 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 many correlations and analogies between sport and business and and uh, Again, I'll get you to describe what leading teams does, but certainly um, from my point of view, being sales focused and business focused, hearing a lot of the, um, the philosophies and, and the frameworks that you guys use at leading teams is, um, is really interesting because I've, I've never felt like sales teams were really teams. They're, they're a loose collection of individuals more often than not. And um, I think we've all struggled to get team performance in the sales environment. Yeah, um, after we talked last time, I thought of that Simon Sinek. I think I think it's attributed to him the quote, "You're not a team because you sit in an office and work together. You're a team because you trust each other and 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 you know want to want to work for the common good." Um, yep. I think that was some of the some of the stuff we it resonated with me when you were talking about that idea that you've never seen sales teams as a team necessarily. And um, yep. so I think we can build on that a little bit more today and 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 chat more about the reasons why that's the case and perhaps what if people are interested in changing it, what they can do about that. 100%. And mate, listen, um, for the people who are new and, and just sort of tuning into interview two, tell us a little bit about Leading Teams again. Yeah, so we, um, we, our purpose at Leading Teams is to help individuals and teams improve their performance. So that's quite general, obviously, but it, it, it gives us a real clarity around what we do. And, and fundamentally, that's in the dynamic space, in the culture and the behavior space. Um, and you'll see the model will throw up later. You know, every team has, has some mechanics to it, some structure, and then there's the dynamics. And, and predominantly, historically, teams have overlooked the dynamic side. And I think more and more people are realizing that, and that's what we're chatting about here today, and is that the dynamic side or the culture or the way people are doing things and the interaction between them is fundamentally um, drives the performance of the team. And, and so whilst we're not suggesting for a second that the other side that the, the talent and the skills aren't important. We just think that's been, things have been too heavily weighted in that side for too long. And, and pleasingly, there's a lot of businesses out there that get it and, and, are, and are sensing that as well. And, and we we really enjoy and are very passionate about the work we get to do. Yeah. And the work you get to do, you've been doing for 27 plus years now or something. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Predominantly initially it did. It started in the, in the sporting world and, um, and, and I think I would have said to you last time, we're still really proud of our connection. We still have strong connections in the sporting world, but we soon worked out pretty quickly or, uh, you know, one of our founders, Ray McLean worked out pretty quickly that the same principles that apply to those sporting teams. And we, we talked a lot about the connection correlation last time, um, are, are the same as what they will be for, um, for any other team, businesses, yeah, and, and any other team. And I can't remember, I gave it a shout out last time, but Ray wrote a book, his first book was called Any Given Team. So um, for those who weren't listening last time and do interested and are interested in reading, it's a, it's a great read and worth a, worth a look. I can vouch for that. I've read it and I loved it. And, and yeah, the, the title says it all, Any Given Team. It doesn't matter whether it's a sporting team or a business team, right? Absolutely. So listen, um, one of the things that's, uh, that came out of the last interview, and I had a lot of feedback on LinkedIn in particular from, from people about, you know, uh, creating team performance is about first and foremost, uh, you know, clarity of purpose or clarity of objectives. You've got to have everyone pulling in the same direction, obviously. And um, the reward structures that we use are, are important in order to facilitate all of that, right? Um, and one of the things I've been banging on about, in fact, I wrote about it in my book, um, and we talked briefly about it last time is how to set up the right reward structures or the reward framework so that you drive the right behavior. I, I mentioned that, um, that paper that I, wrote, I read years ago um, by Stephen Kerr, who said that, you know, the folly of rewarding behavior A and expecting behavior B. And, and in my world, Daniel, um, in the sales world, you know, I've, I've always tried to, I've always grappled with What's the best way to compensate salespeople to drive the right behavior? And I think that's never been more important than it is right now, simply because we now all live in this subscription consumption based world where everything's as a service. Um, when I first started selling Daniel, it was, you know, it was very much end of month, end of quarter, you know, go, go, go churn. I, I call it churn and burn sales where, you know, you sell a product once and you move on to the next person. You, you, didn't, you didn't really care whether the product uh, was implemented correctly and delivered value to the buyer. I just was on to the next sale. That's kind of how it was. 
But now everybody's focused on recurring revenue. And that old thing about in order to get recurring revenue, you've got to have recurring value. So as business owners and business leaders, it's incumbent upon us to make sure our sales department, our marketing department, our customer success department is delivering recurring value at every step of the buyer journey all the way through the life cycle, right? So we're in a different world now. And I think that the old fashioned way of compensating salespeople around just good old fashioned revenue attainment, it's a very self-focused or self-serving measurement you know, maximizing revenue and then getting a percentage of that revenue as a commission, I think creates misalignment with what buyers want and, and what buyers want is all that matters. You agree? Uh, yeah, obviously, absolutely. And, and I imagine some of the feedback you got from some of your um, LinkedIn followers and, and, you know, it was obviously overwhelming the feedback we got, which was fantastic, would be, yeah, great in theory, Graham, but yeah, you, you know, you come in here and show us how it's, because we, we've had those conversations with sales teams over a number of years. We get that what we're, what we're suggesting is straightforward. We get it's not simple. It's a real paradigm shift. It, it is a real change in the way we do it. Yeah. So the easy option is to continue doing down the path. But of course, that definition of sanity would suggest, you know, um, we keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. Yeah. Um, fundamentally, you, but you, if, if you want to get people to behave in a certain way, you reward that behavior. So. Yeah. Um, you're suggesting, and, and I would 100% agree, that people are more and more focused on the customer outcome. It's become a really competitive industry. In fact, some clients I work with say, you know, we exceed customer expectations might be in their behaviours, and some of them actually challenged it. Said, you know what, that's becoming harder and harder, guys, because customers' expectations are becoming higher and higher. Yep. But if that is your expectation of your people, then wouldn't it make sense to reward that? Like we talk about bringing people into a common purpose, and yet at the end of the month, we reward them based on what they did. And yeah. I hear horrible stories, not, pe- not bad people, not toxic people, but they'll take a call and it'll be, from, it'll be from their colleague next to them. It'll be their client. It'll be a deal that needs to be fixed there. It's not their, it's not their client. So it's, sorry, I'll get off the phone as quick as I can. Yep, they'll call me back, bang, and I'll get onto my client. So we've just missed a sale. We've just missed a possible return revenue, all of that stuff because it wasn't my sale and it wasn't going to help me get my end of month commission. Yep. Now, if we were able to somehow pull our commission, somehow have a, a, a group commission target, that wouldn't have happened. And, and it's been so rewarding for some of the clients who've actually made that shift. They've actually rewarded based on a group targets and they've rewarded based on behaviors. And often the behaviors, their values, I'll have a value thing up there. So we put the customer first. Well, don't tell me, we all know how many different um, MPS, um, you know, customer rating systems there are in the world. Um, that would make sense to reward based on that. hundred percent. Um, hundred yeah. percent. And look, um, we both mentioned last time, we're both country boys. I like to go back to basics, right? Let's just keep things simple in business. I think we overcomplicate things, but um, to your point about, yeah, sounds great in theory, Graham, but what, what do you mean? How do you do this now? Um, well, let, let's start with what most business leaders that I talk to now, Daniel, are focused on. They're focused on lifetime customer value, right? In this new context of everything as a service, lifetime customer value. They're, they're focused on churn mitigation or net retention, Right, recurring revenue, recurring value, net retention is critical. That's almost the number one metric that people are measuring now. So if it's really, really, really important that we keep customers happy, and and in fact, let's let's go one step further. We're trying to create raving fans, right? Um, Customers that are so delighted with the the service we've given them that they want to tell other people, and they give you referrals, and they become, you know, lighthouse customers, testimonials, etc. So if that's what we're trying to achieve, then how do we put in place tactically? the reward structures that drive those kind of outcomes. And as you said, it's, 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 it's measurements and KPIs around net promoter score, customer satisfaction, customer loyalty. It's, it's paying the rep if you have to pay a commission still. And I argue in some cases you don't, but if you do, maybe it's paying them on the second and third sale rather than on the first to encourage that, that ongoing kind of, you know, arms around experience that buyers now expect. Because as you said, the buyer's expectation is now way up here. Yeah. I still, I think that's one element. I still think the other element of it is um, rewarding them based on what they'll do for the, for their salesperson next to them as well. Because I still think that, that there's twofold that I think people are getting, I've got to, tr- so I'll, I'll focus so heavily on the, on the uh, client, but I, yet I'll treat people internally really poorly. I, poorly in the end that just doesn't work either for me it's the it's the both bit what can we as a group how can we as a group yeah absolutely absolutely as a group you're going to get rewarded based on the, the um, return customers you create in this uh, or based on an mps score whatever whatever it looks like yeah. um 
the other, in an ideal world for us, how that target comes about would be sit down in a room and have a discussion. Okay, guys, here's our purpose. What do you reckon's a fair? Forget the number because that'll be in the end. That'll be probably determined by the leader. But again, at leading teams, we've had discussions where that's got decided by the group. But the actual target, we're we're a massive. We're an empowerment model. We're massive on getting the group to buy into. Yeah, I reckon a fair way to judge us based on our customer experiences is how many come back. So we want to be judged on that for the year. Because now we've bought into the we've bought into the target, and away we go. It's not about the tail wagging the dog. The leader will still have to see that that fits in what, what, what they want to do. But if yep. we're true to a purpose and somehow that purpose relates to, I used the example last time with the client around simplifying finance. Okay. So that the target is get a measurement for how we've simplified finance yep. or, and how we've made it easier for people to live. Um, and, and again, it might be return customers, whatever it is, but the group, one of the sayings we use is none of us are as smart as all of us. Um, the group will have an idea and, and the more we can get them to buy in, the more they'll jump on board with that target. And the it, results will be exciting. That, that, I, I totally agree. And it fascinates me, all of this stuff. I, I think you're right about the, um, you know, the, the all of us kind of um, mentality. If you think about the context in business, again, I'll go back to sales. But if you think about this, this context that we're in where everything is a service, lifetime customer value, focus on you know, winning the customer, but then keeping the customer, there's, there's some um, analysts now saying that about 70%, 70 to 80% of revenue now is derived post the initial sale. So it's all of this, you know, micro transactions that happen throughout the course of the, the engagement. And so what we're saying there is that really the sales department or marketing create a lead, sales take that lead and then they run with it. Hopefully they convert. If they do convert, then 10 or 20% of the revenue happens at the point of sale. If you're lucky, the bulk of the revenue is now happening down the track in customer success. So to your point about the team, um, customer success, marketing, pre-sales, sales, all now together as one big group. How do you get all of those people aligned and, um, you know, focused on that clarity of purpose that you talk about and then rewarded the right way? Because one of the things that strikes me too, it's, it's kind of insane when you think about it, is the sales team is the only department in the business that gets a commission. Yep. The, the customer success people don't get paid commission. Yep. Marketing don't get paid. Do those people work any less than yep. salespeople? Yeah. And what do you think that creates in that environment, <laughs> in that world? And why is it done, Graham? Because that's how it's always been done. Correct. Um, and, and the disconnect we see between those groups and, you know, the salespeople are the rock stars of the group, you know, and they're the ones that are, you know, yeah, it's, um, again, by nature also, the personality of those salespeople will generally be the most gregarious outgoing, the, la the, the, and so that it, this is challenging, but yeah, we're all we're looking for. And again, the beauty of our work is we don't go in suggesting any team's broken and we understand these are things that are inherent systems in sales businesses, but we're just there looking for opportunity to grow and opportunity to improve. And the, the best way to do it is to engage your group, have conversation around what's working and what's not and how can we change this? And how can we make it better? Not what's broken, but how can we make it better? No, and look, recognizing it and acknowledging, as you just said, that we, you know, this is a complex set of problems, right? And we're dealing with this legacy of where business has come from. And so naturally there's this resistance to change and there's this uncertainty about how do we, how do we now do this? Because this is what we've always done and this is what made us successful in the past. But, you know, to use the sporting analogy, the game has changed. The, the, the opposition has changed. The, the bloody venues changed. Everything's changed. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us, as you say, to, to start to look at how can we improve the way we create team performance. Yeah, I, again, I probably, I agree 100%. I push back and argue a little bit that this model, what we're suggesting would have worked 50, it just, it, I, I think we say it's changed. I think people wanted the same back then, but that's how it was done. I just think more and more people are opening their mind to it. Again, there's plenty of leaders who are doing it old school way now and still being successful. And they might be watching this saying, hey, it ain't broke, don't fix it. That we, we, respectfully, all we're saying is we think this is a better, more sustainable way to engage your people and to get better outcome. Remember, at the end of the day, what we're having conversations about here is improving the performance, which in the end, we don't shy away from the fact that, that looks like a bottom line. Um, I wonder if it's worth us, me throwing up our model and, and that can perhaps help to simplify what we're talking about. Is please, that, please, please yeah, yeah, yeah. Th throw that up on the screen, um, Daniel, while, while you're doing that. Um, yeah, I think uh, everything you're saying is so spot on and, and relevant to 
to everything I'm seeing right now in terms of, and you said it actually last time, Daniel, in the, in the first interview where you said, okay, you might be doing well now. Everything might be going great in your business and that's terrific. Uh, but how much better could you be doing? You know, we have that conversation a lot with people who say, you know, but, but it's okay. But, and one of the challenges to all this stuff is it'll take senior people, it'll take leaders at a business who are actually open to grow and open to change and open to new ideas. And sometimes that can be the, the limiting factor. Um, I'll flick through this. You can you throw questions at me, Graham, and we can just have the conversation. Um, we'll go as yep. quick or as slow as you want to. But obviously, uh, it's a premise when we work with people that um, we want, they're wanting to be high-performing teams. Again, when I'm starting with a group and I throw that up, I'm always jumpy because I think people might be sitting in the room saying, and the people might be watching us now saying, hang on, Daniel, we're already a high-performing team. Again, the only thing I'd throw to that is, can you be a high-performing team? So this is yep. all about improvement rather than making a judgment on where people are at. Yep. Um, we talked about this last week. We've probably done it to death almost, but this idea that we actually buy into a common purpose. Um, when I work with most leadership teams, I reckon I ask them in the group, what's the, what's the purpose? And they're pretty good. But then I ask them, well, yeah, how many in your staff? And they say 85. I say, yeah, what about number 85 on your list using a sporting term? What, what do they think the purpose is? And um, <laughs> I guess I tell a bit of a utopian purpose story and it's the, it's the man on the moon story. Um, uh, the story goes to JFK, um, had a he had a mandate in what 62 i think it was to get man on the moon by the end of the 60s and he did it was doing a tour of nasa and wandering around and with all the dignitaries and, and saw a janitor and went over and had a chat and asked the janitor um what are you doing and the janitor said i'm helping put man on the moon some of your followers might have heard the story before but it's pretty if we t put that in context that was seven years before neil did or didn't set foot on the moon depending on what you believe yep, yep. um and and this janitor um this janitor was cleaning toilets. Yep. Um, I always ask people I work with, who is responsible for that answer? And some say the janitor. And I said, no, not really. And in the end, someone worked out it was the leader. It was that janitor's leader. It was someone above them. Yep. Culture is set by our leaders. Um, yep. Then I asked the question, what was the outcome of the janitor having an attitude like that? And someone gave me a really good answer recently. They said, bloody clean dunnies. And that's <laughs> the reality of it. You've got an engaged person who wants to play their role for a team because they feel something part a part of something bigger if that person in your sales team something bigger is a bigger paycheck at the end of the month then you're going to get limited outcome from them yep yep um and so i guess that's the that's the piece um the other one the story um we talk about any given team i've got a colleague a few years ago worked with a rock band just to prove how diverse some of our clients are and <laughs> he asked the question of, of the group what what's your purpose and and I won't get this verbatim, but three of the answers were to make great music, great rock and roll, um, to connect with the hearts and minds of the people. And the third one was to make a truckload of money. Um, now, the problem there, of course, was that that was three very different answers. Yep. Um, and it wasn't my colleague's job to say, oh, I like the third one, go for that. It was his job to get them to all see how could they all look, how could they all live together in those worlds, or how do they come together with a common one? Because until yep. they get that, they just won't be aligned. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. And look, winning, winning the hearts and minds of your fans as a, as a musician versus making a truckload of money, they're two totally different goals, which then require, I imagine you're going to talk about this in a second, totally different tactics, right? Yeah. Or could have taken them in very different paths, right? So, yeah. but if we don't have that conversation up front and again, amongst exec teams, I'm sure it's happening. It's the ability to bring on the rest of the team, just, yeah. just like that janitor to maximize the performance. So um, that's why we think the purpose question up front is really important. The other beauty of a purpose. Um, and again, if I go to the example I used with the, with the finance uh, brokerage mob I talked about last time, we simplify finance. You, you notice with their purposes, it's simple. It's not corporate speak. It's not 30 words long. It's something they can remember. It's something they can attach to. And most importantly, when they're discussing whether they're going to do X or Y, the question can ask is, does it help the client simplify finance? And if the answer is no, let's stop doing it. Yeah. And of course, a lot of internal bickering and bullshit and politics that goes on in business can be stopped if we ask the question, hey, is what we're doing now helping us achieve our purpose? It takes real discipline, I imagine, to, to keep everybody on that, on that you know, singular focus. Yeah, but first and foremost, they have to believe it and buy into it in the first place, right? So if you've got a document that's sitting in the top drawer somewhere with this 30-word um, purpose statement that someone created at the last strap plan and that's where it sits, well, there's no discipline involved because no one... Yeah, I've often it. asked. I often ask a group, "What's your purpose?" And there's some red faces, and they're looking down. Um, yeah. No judgment on it. That's the reality. So this, when we make it simple, when we make it connect to us, when we make it us, it's something we want to get our bed to do. Then we're a chance. Then it still does take discipline after that, as you say. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. So that's the starting point. And then we break up any teams into two parts. And we've, we've discussed this a bit briefly already today. It's, it's the mechanics and the dynamics. Um, and, and the mechanics is that you, you can see it there, the KPIs, the strategy, the, the, the tactics, the techniques, the skills of, of the staff, the org structure, et cetera, the day-to-day runnings of the business. Yep. Um, and the other bit is what the space that we get to work in. And that is the culture and behaviors, the dynamics. Yep. Um, Graham, when I ask groups, I, I draw a pretend line down the middle there and ask groups to um, give me a percentage of time. They think most organizations spend in the mechanics versus the dynamics. Um, yep. I don't think I've ever had anyone answer it less than 80%. I've had it probably up to 99, anywhere between there. Um, 80% mechanics, 20% correct. dynamics. Correct. And again, that's the minimum. Often it's 90, 95. And I don't, I don't tend to put them on the spot and say, what about your team? But it's just in general. But often they'll refer, well, we're here, we're 99. Um, now, I'll throw it to you uh, without notice. Why do you reckon, because I think most people, as I say, would agree with that. Why do you think it is that we spend so much time in the mechanics? There's a couple of pretty valid reasons, I guess. Well, I think it relates to the first bullet point there, right? The KPIs, the measurements. That's kind of, for me as a sales or a business person, we all get, okay, what's my goal? What's my daily activities look like? And how am I being measured? Like, what's my boss going to say if I don't hit certain KPIs? So we naturally default to operational, yeah. inward, inward focusing KPIs, I, I think. Beautiful. Tangible, measurable. Absolutely the answer. We set it up. You're right. The KPIs is there. The other reason people often give me is because as hard as our jobs are, it's actually easier. It's easier to sit over there than it is in the other space. 100%. Because you know, when the inner what hits the fan over here, sometimes it's easier to just put the head down, bum up and pretend it ain't happening. Yeah, uh, so that would true. be, that would be, you know, I work with a bunch of orthopedic surgeons, God bless them. And they're a lovely bunch of, um, of, they are all fellas. Um, and I didn't realize this, but, um, they do about 16 years of study before they become a fully fledged ortho. And right. I asked them how much time do you reckon in those 16 years you spent, um, focusing on the dynamics and they had a bit of a chuckle and they were quick to acknowledge that or someone said 0.001%, which I thought was generous because clearly, and clearly when I'm going in for a knee operation, I want my doctor to be pretty good in the mechanic space. So I'm not suggesting for a second that that's not important because I know any, any of our viewers out there would, would, would quickly shut off if I suggested that. I'm just here to challenge the 80, 20, 90, 10 notion. And why am I? Because I've been able to experience a model that focused on more heavily well, on the other as a, as a sports person. And now obviously I'll get to do it every day with corporates. And, and Daniel, listen, we touched on it last time, what uh, Peter Drucker said all those years ago about culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? And I, and I've, I, I totally agree with that. And as you say, um, throughout 30 years of my career working with US software companies, um, primarily in sales departments, always in sales departments, I think the number is probably 98.2. Like I don't think I've spent any of my time really uh, focused on cultural behaviours in the, in the dynamics. It's all been about, you know, sales is a numbers game, Graham. Just just keep hitting yeah. the numbers, keep hitting the KPIs, keep operationalising everything you can do and just crank that handle a little bit harder each year so that you can get some growth, you know? Yeah, and our experience would be your 2%, which maybe, let's even say five is the annual, uh, let's go away for, for a day. You know, we, get a lot of, we get a lot of calls in October. Can you, hey, can you do something with our team before Chrissy? What, what for? Oh, just a bit of a team building day to GM up going to Chrissy, you know? Yeah. We're obviously able to respectfully decline and explain that, that you know, if you, if you want that, then, then there's a paintballing place down the road or, you know, if there's a pub that you can go. So, um, absolutely. So, again, not to suggest that it's not important, um, but, you know, I think Richard Branson's line is re- you know, recruit on attitude and, and, and train them up. Now, having said, we, we know there needs to be a technical, depending on the role, uh, an ability and a skill there. But um, we're, we're try- our, our model is trying to skew the focus away from that. Understanding, you'll see further down that we've split the ca- dynamics and mechanics. You'll see further down that they absolutely are intertwined. They're not, they're not um, completely separate as this, as this model points out. Yep. So we've put the word culture there. It gets bandied around a lot. People struggle to define it. Well, I guess we simply define it as the way we do things, the, co- the behaviours that we reward, the behaviours that we accept. Um, if we walk past the behaviour in our business, if we will pass the behavior of that gun salesperson who, who has really poor behavior to a client or to a fellow a colleague, what are we saying about the behavior? Mm. We're, saying, we're saying it's okay. And that then, whether we like it or not, becomes our culture. Oh, I've, seen um, a lot, I've seen a lot of that, Daniel, where you know, people turn a blind eye to the rock star um, or, or whatever because um, he's bringing in the money or she's bringing in the money. 
And yeah, that, that sets a precedent internally about, you know, a willingness to accept certain behaviors and, and create exceptions. And as we know in team sport, that, that destroys your chance of, of building a good culture, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I've seen it play out in sport and in the business where, and, and rightfully, and I've actually, funnily enough, I've actually been a coach at the footy and I've, I've had to wrestle with this myself. And it's when you almost slap yourself in the face and saying, hang on, what are your beliefs here? Because it, it, the idea that oh, if I get rid of this person, we're going to really struggle. And I think what we worked out over the journey, um, Ray, my colleague, often throws the one that the graveyards are full of irreplaceable people. So this idea that you know we're never going to be able to move on without that one. More often than not, when, when we're able to push past that person, for however that happens, uh, whether they whether they behave their way out of the building themselves or whether we move past it for whatever reason and challenge those behaviours, there's a collective side that you can almost hear in the business because every the idea that the rest of the team weren't seeing that behaviour is, is, is farcical. They were seeing it. They weren't able to speak up against it because the leaders weren't doing anything about it. Once it's done, you just see this, this, the sigh of relief and then this rise from from below and that can be really exciting but obviously again daunting and challenging at the time so um couple, an example again uh, i had um i started with a team a few years ago and it was it was supposed to be a 9 30 start and and um it was a team of about 12 at 9 30 there was two of us in the room i was one of them and there was a, a a lady in the room with me that lady how long do you reckon she'd been in the business probably two weeks no, it was, her, it was her first day. <laughs> now, we ended, up, we ended up starting at 9.45. Now, no big deal to me, but what, what do you reckon if that, lady, if that lady had half a brain, pretty quickly she's going to either press snooze on the alarm clock or she's going to grab the coffee at 9.30. Like, like they all walked in with coffees at 9.40 ready to go. Now, they, their induction might have been a really impressive one where they all sat down and showed her the values and said, we're a really professional mob. But the behavior right there was telling her that we mm-hmm. don't value time or we, we certainly don't value external people coming in. Um, and 9.30, 9.45 is close enough. Nothing toxic or, or terminal, but that reality was whether she liked it or not, that was the culture she was walking into. Um, yeah. Uh, and it's disappointing. I've seen um, in my own career, Daniel, so many situations. In fact, with, even with my own teams, I will say to those, those people, listen, I don't care about words. You know, words are cheap. I only, I only care about actions because that's what tells me what the real culture is. And, and yet turning up late to meetings, that's a classic, isn't it? Um, if, you, if you don't care enough to be on time to an internal meeting, do you care enough to be on time for a customer meeting? Like, uh, and I think the, the old saying, your actions are screaming so loud that I, I can't hear a word you're saying. Uh, the, the, that, that's, the, that's what you're saying. And, and yeah. so for us, the culture is, so again, that, that lady or anyone who starts, you know, for the people watching out there, starts in a business, we talk about induction and people think it's the reading the Health and Safety book or going through all the manuals or signing your super forms, all that. Yes, that's the mechanics manual. But the dynamics manual, when, when someone on the, on the Friday night after their first week of work goes, or you can't go to the pub with a partner at the moment, but does whatever they do or catch up with friends, the obvious question is, how's your new work? Now, their answer is going to be based solely on their experiences, not what they've been told, but what they've seen. Yes. That, that will be the culture. Yep. Um, and that's the true induction of a, of a, of a staff member. So, so that's what culture is. Again, so the question is, how do we go about working on it, improving it? This is the stuff we talked about it being easy to stay in the mechanic space. This is, this is why, especially the first the, the point there on the left, the strong professional relationship. So what we're talking about there is not necessarily, you know, getting out on the drink together. Um, certainly when I was playing footy and we want to work on our relationships, we did a fair bit of that. And Barroom bonding. Yeah. I'm happy to say I still love a drink now with my leading teams crew. So I'd be a hypocrite if I'd suggest I don't enjoy that, but that's not what we're talking about there. Yeah. Um, if you've got that, it's a bonus. What we're talking about there is having genuine um, mutual trust and respect. Yep. Um, um, and Graham, when I, when I challenge teams, you know, especially technical focus teams and sales teams and no exceptions around the need for this, the relationships, the, generally the pushback is, um, you know, I say, you, you know, you need to spend time on it. Generally their pushback is we just don't have time. Um, well, and, and look, I, Daniel, I get that too. And, and I've seen the pressure cooker situations that are created on salespeople, particularly by outdated leadership that, that still want to focus on short term metrics, volume metrics, um, end of month, end of quarter madness and all that stuff that goes on. But you're quite right. I've always said to my teams, harmony for me is overrated to some extent. I don't mind if there's, if there's disagreement as long as there's always 100% respect and professionalism. I can, I can have a disagreement with you in a business context about something, but I'll always do it respectfully. And that's what creates the strong relationships yeah. that you're talking about. 
Well, we'll flip it around. We'll, we'll, there'll be the, the box that will come up in a minute or we'll speak to exactly what you're talking about. See, that we, and I should have said that from the outset, we, we're very clear that high-performing teams don't sit in the room and nod their head and agree with each other. We, we would call that artificial harmony. And we think that's the high-performing team is the antithesis of that. Um, right. um, one of, one of uh, girls who worked in our marketing team um, a few years back, she the bit that she was blown away by at leading teams, her first experience was sitting down in a room, have, hearing and sitting through a really rigorous and robust conversation and debate, which was probably more confronting than she'd seen at any of her previous businesses, right? And the fact that people were actually having these challenging conversations face-to-face for a start. But that wasn't the bit that blew her away. The bit that was blew her away is when we adjourned for lunch, she walked around the corner and that same group of 10, 12 people sat in a, sat in a um at a lunch table, had a drink and pretended like that hadn't happened because it was just a conversation based on performance because there was genuine trust there rather than they went off in threes and bitched about each other. Um, and, that's, and that's the challenge. So if I go back to the don't have time bit, what, as you said, we, we get they're busy, but what they're really telling us, me and each other is it's not a priority. Um, yeah. And I love telling the story. I use that line a few years ago with a client and the client said, fun enough, Daniel Electra said the same recently. Um, and he challenged us, um, next time you go to use the term don't have time, um, change it to it's not a priority. Yeah. This, this fellow went on with the story. He went home that night and, and his eight-year-old son said, um, yeah, Dad, can you read me a story? Now, the fellow was about to say, I don't have time, but he did what he was told in his head, luckily. And he said to himself, you yeah, know, not a pro. What do you reckon he did? He, he read the story, obviously. And, it is a priority. Yeah. yeah. Of course it is. Now, when anyone who's got kids and I share that story with they, they actually get shitty with me because I hate because they come back afterwards and said, I haven't been able to say no now. And it's funny. But I had, I had a client recently say it has impacted on my decision making at work because I, I, if I think, is this a priority? Our challenge at leading teams and, and challenge as sales leaders is to get people to understand the, the connection between that relationship and performance. Because until they see that, if their dollar's driven, which fair enough they are, they won't see it. So if we move well, past it, or go on, Graham. Yeah, I was just going to say, and you, that uh, obviously the reason I love the model here so much, Daniel, is because what you're saying is that you know, if you are making decisions based on is it a priority or not, then that just funnels straight up to the top of the, the, the pyramid here to the common purpose, right? Is this part of the common purpose? Okay, no, it's not. All right, well, it's not a priority. Ties in beautifully. Um, it ties in beautifully. You'll see the other box there is the agreed behavioural framework. This idea, and we've talked about this a bit, that we actually buy into how do we want to behave here. Um, rather than the boss come in and tell us, the agreed bit in our point is really, is really important. The idea that we'll ask the people um, for a set of behaviours, values, how they want to exist. Now, we get new staff all the time. We can't stop the work every time a new staff comes in. Hey, we, we need to update the agreed behaviours. That's why for us, if there are a set of behaviours that people value and really care for, when you, re- when you recruit people, when you interview them, they'll be front and centre and people will understand they're coming to a business that values X and Y. It won't be a surprise to them when they get handed a document on day one and said, oh, by the way, you've got to live by these. Yeah. So that way they actually know, they can actually make the choice before they come to the business. Um, well, and look, Daniel, um, let's touch on this for a little bit because I, I played a lot of team sport and AFL footy my, myself in the old days and I coached a team, um, a, a footy team myself. And so all of this resonates beautifully with the teams. And I know when, when leading teams first sort of came to prominence, uh, particularly in the, um, the world of sport, uh, there was a lot of talk about the fact that you guys would put in place these agreed behavioural frameworks within the team context. And you quite often uh, challenge teams to put people out the front for a 360 degree you know, peer review sort of thing. And that would all become very public. And I know, you know, this is where this, uh, this model of yours uh, stems from. Is that right? Where you would get teams to agree and communicate and, and document, I suppose, um, what the framework is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. So the, the peer feedback, which we can get into, is absolutely an extension. It's, it's the obvious extension of that. Once we've agreed with what we want to do, the next question is, well, how's everyone going with it? Who needs feedback? And feedback we'll get to in a minute, isn't just around challenging someone's behaviour. Feedback is rewarding someone's behaviour and that's the bit that's often lost in, in, in that piece. Yeah. But the starting point is some simple questions like what's the truth about us as a team now? You know, just a checkpoint. Um, what are some counterproductive behaviours that are going on within this team? Um, and I've never worked with a group that's got zero on that front. If they do, I'll probably call um, BS on it. So yeah. it's just, and that's just, your, that's just your opportunity to lay it all bare. Often people say, gee, it's good to have that out in the open or it's good to know others are feeling like I am, which would tell us, of course, that we're not talking about it previously. Yep. So you just lay it bare. Okay, if that's what's going on at the moment, 
flip it around. How do we want to be seen? What do we want to be known for? And how, what behaviours will we accept and will we reward going forward? And it can be really an empowering day. We start at this low point sometimes with this counterproductive behaviour, depending on how the team's going. But then it's, wow, okay, you're telling me if I live those five or six behaviours, I can be a valued member of this team. And, and for me as an 18-year-old playing footy where, where this whole thing started for me, that, that's what made sense to me. It's, you know, I just, I'd say it doesn't matter if I'm 30, play 200 games or one of the best and fairest. You're telling me if I have a crack and do what those behaviours are, I'm going to be a respected member of this team. Um, yes, competence will come into it at some stage. That's where the mechanic sits. But for starters, it's, we, yeah, we think it's a pretty good place to start. So when you've got the relationships, the trust and respect. Now you talked about that team sitting around and not just agreeing with each other. That's where the trust and respect comes. So we know we're doing it for the right reason. Yeah. And then you've got this framework to base the conversations on. So I'm not attacking you, Graham, but I'm challenging a behavior because we are sat in a room and agreed on it. You end up with what we call genuine conversations. Yeah. Um, your, your viewers will know them as tough, rigorous, courageous. Gee, I heard, I heard someone recently tell me they went and did a fierce conversation course, which, which scared me a little. I didn't know whether that just meant they stood at either side of the room and screamed at each other for half an hour. Cause when I hear the word fierce, obviously it sounds really competitive. Yeah. Um, we use genuine for a reason for that very reason, because it's a bit of a, a lot of it's around self talk. Um, if I'm telling myself I've got to have a tough conversation, there's a fair chance I'm going to put it off. And certainly if I tell you, Graham, that I want to have a tough conversation with you, I'm sure you're not going to come into that in an overly positive frame of mind. Um, no. We understand they're difficult. We call them genuine for that reason um, because we want them to be two-way. And, and the other bit around those genuine conversations, they also include that rewarding behaviour that we talked about before. Yep. And, um, you know, one of the things obviously that comes in here, Daniel, and you can talk to this, no doubt it's probably coming up on, on your model, but um, the, the, the whole idea of constructive feedback, most, most salespeople or business people are not good at any kind of constructive feedback um, or any kind of... Um, uh, negativity around what you what they're currently doing, or um, you know, criticism. People just don't take criticism very well, do they? And, and so, and that's where, and we're really strong with this when we work with clients. And it, it might be a bit semantics, but we think it's really important for the self talk and the team talk. That's why we throw the word criticism and constructive criticism out the window, because right. we think if you go back to that strong professional relationships box, if there's trust and respect in a relationship, Graham, and I challenge you on something, and and there's trust and respect, you're going to think that I'm doing it because I care about you and because I want you to get better. Got so it. fundamentally, if we have that relationship, there can never be such thing as bad or negative feedback because all or I'm criticism. doing is I'm just trying to help you. Yeah. Now, of course, if we don't have that relationship and I, and, and I deliver it poorly, different story. But that's why the model goes like it does with those two sitting above the genuine conversations. Makes sense. At, at the end of the first day with groups, often they'll say that one of their commitments will be, I'm going to go and have more genuine conversations. And I always say, God bless you. God bless you for your commitment. But, the reality is you ain't going to have more genuine conversations until you've worked on the relationship bit first. Or indeed, if you try to, it won't be received still well until you've got some of that trust and respect. So, yeah, it interests me how this unfolds, Daniel. And um, I'm, I'm very I'm fascinated really about how often you've seen in your dealings with um, businesses, not so much sporting teams, but the business clients that you guys have got. How often do you find the sales department has got when you walk in the door, you know, before you even uh, start your, your programs, when you walk in the door, how many of them have actually got a uh, an agreed behavioural framework or even just a, a written down common purpose? Ha have many of them done that already? Yeah. Um, I would say 70 to 80% of the clients we work with would have something there. Now, if you ask me a different question was how many would be able to recite it and how many would be able to, would put their hand on the heart and say that that means a lot to them. That would be a different percentage altogether. Yeah. Um, you know, I, again, I had a really, a really high level, um, big reasonably um, strong and solid and very successful business uh, I work with. And I asked him, I talked to the CEO and I said, have you got values? And he said, we have, but gee, it'd be a good question to ask. And I asked him. And, and again, as I said earlier, they, they were pretty red faces. I was sat there. And so we don't, when we come in with that scenario, we don't say we're leading teams here, we're here to start again, whatever you've got. We just ask, what have you got? And, and, and if they don't remember them, then we say, well, let's, let's start it again and let's see well, where we end up. Well, yeah, everyone's got, you know, a mission statement and a value statement. And they're, and they're just, as you say, they're just words that are written down somewhere. Someone in marketing's probably come up with these, these wonderful motherhood statements and words. But yeah, when you go around and, and, and ask the average staff member, the average salesperson, what are the company values? they're probably not going to, certainly in my experience, they're not going to know what they are or, or be able to recite them at all. 
No, because A, they weren't part of the agreed bit, so they weren't part of doing it. And, and B, their leaders, the people in charge, aren't valuing it enough and they're not, again, this is more often than not, the only time they come out is at an annual performance review, which most, sadly, most staff see as a, a tick and flick, uh, I hope I can get a bonus and don't get sacked conversation. And that's why in our world of leading teams, we'd, we'd be advocates of, of removing the the annual performance review, which you might think that's a bit strange given you're about feedback, Daniel. But of course, we don't want to remove conversations or reviews. We just think that every conversation should be, could be one of those. Oh, I've heard that many leaders tell me, oh yeah, I've got this feedback for, for Johnny, but I'm going to save it up because I've got a performance review in a few months and, I'll, and I'll, I'll hit him with it then. And I think, yeah, okay. So for the next three months, we're going to change that behavior because, um, because we're going to leave it for the performance review. So yeah. that, that seems, the idea is leaders, if they value these behaviors and they're truly, we, they're called values for a reason because we're, we're supposed to value them, yep. that every conversation, that everything we do, they are front and center and we reward it. We have monthly, monthly awards, weekly awards based on our values. Yep. Um, one of the most rewarding times for me in my, in my work is getting to go to Christmas shows with my clients and, and presenting the values-based award to the, someone who's been voted by that business um, as best. And coincidentally, don't, don't worry about it. That person will also be doing very well in the mechanics, mechanic space because that's, the I guess, the last point of this for the people who are still sitting there cynical about it. We're strong believers in that these genuine conversations and those behaviours will drive your performance. Yeah. See, I think the misnomer is that it's a bit of HR fluff, this stuff on the right-hand side. But I, I just go back to the simple examples of when my coach 20-odd years ago got Ray involved in this program at the footy team. It wasn't so we could go home to our wives and girlfriends and say, what a lovely bunch of boys they are to play footy with. He got, he got him in to help us win, to help us improve. Yeah. Um, building trust, having a framework, having genuine conversations. The reason, as hard as they are, the reason we push to have them is because they will help us improve. Um, so, the, yeah. so the dynamics or the culture and the agreed behavioral framework is really what drives the output, if you like, or the throughput on the mechanics side. hundred percent. Now it doesn't mean you, as I said before, it doesn't mean you can't, you've got, can't have structure. You, you've got to have the structure. And in fact, to be honest, leading teams, we've been challenged over the journey. We think we're pretty good in the dynamic space, but we, we let ourselves down quite often in the mechanics space. So we, and we'll get better all the time at that. So you've got to still have the mechanics in place. But, but it's the other side that will drive that. This is not, I'm not suggesting for a minute that we don't, this is about high levels of accountability. Don't, again, there's a bit of a misnomer. It's a bit of a fluff. It's an easy way out. Everyone gets a say. Absolutely. Everyone gets to create their world. But the downside for everyone is it's their job then to uphold their world. And to, now it's you've got not, to live by it. Yeah, 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 but you can't go back to the boss when someone next to you is doing something you don't like. No, no, no. We've got to build that trust and have that genuine conversation. Yep. Uh, and that's where it gets hard, right? First day, people love it. Oh, wow, I get to create this world. This is great. Oh, but you mean you're going to come back and review me? And you mean I might get feedback based on this? Wow, this is challenging. This, and Daniel, Daniel, there's obviously a hell of a lot of uh, uh, thought and research and, and um, thinking that's gone into this. And, and obviously now you've got you know, 27 years of experience in rolling this, this sort of program out, and I'm sure it's evolved. But um, if, if there was a really simple takeaway from this interview for, for people listening, um, what other than you know, other than contacting leading teams and getting you guys in to help them, what would the what would the average sales leader do right now in terms of trying to trying to pull together something on the on the dynamic side or the culture side? What what, what would your suggestion be? Yeah, I I guess the the bit that as I do this and I think about is if if you ask those sales teams to review how they go with the relationships. I reckon most of them say, oh, I do a lot of this stuff with my clients. So again, it's that in turn of that one-on-one focus because I've got to drive that number one dollar, which is brilliant. So I think salespeople inherently are better at doing this, this stuff than perhaps engineers or others that are really technically focused. So for me, their personality lends itself to it. But I'd be asking that leader to think about what's the connection like within your team? What are the levels of relationships like with your team? Um, even ask them the question, what levels of rigor are there in the conversations? Yeah. And, and, and the even harder one to ask him or her is, do you think your team are able to challenge you? Do you think your people, and we, we might next time get into a model we use around relationships to assess the, the depth of relationship. Can people actually say what they think? Uh, can people call you and challenge you on, on it? Yeah, look, again, in my experience, and I'm only you know, one person with my, my limited view on the world and my, my you know, experience in over 30 years of working in different sales departments, but... I think if you, you spoke to the average sales leader in the average business right now, um, anywhere in the world, any industry, and you said, does your team, your sales team, live by a common purpose? Let's start right at the top. What, what is the common purpose? Most of them will say, our purpose is to hit the numbers, hit the yeah. quota. 
Uh, if well, yeah, then then for me, that's the you, you've led me beautifully. If that's if that's the case, mate, then that's the takeaway. The first point would be sit down with a group and say, hey, well, why are we all here? And if their answer is to make money, then respectfully push back because that ain't that's that ain't going to get you as far as you want to be. Making money will be an outcome, but what are why why are we here? Connect, try and connect to their clients to each other to get them out of bed to come to work for you and with you. Yeah, mate. This is a, a fantastic model, Daniel. Is is there more on this slide to, to go through, or have you? That no, that's that's it. That's um, it. Yeah, I, I always say pretty straightforward. I'm, we haven't resplit the atom or anything. The the challenge is it's not simple because it takes that hard work and persistence, and it takes a group of people to jump on board. And sadly, with a model like this, sadly or 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 not, depending on how you look at it, that that if if this gets momentum up, we lose we lose soldiers because of the stuff we've talked about. Um, yeah. But that only happens until the, the culture is being really clearly articulated and a group of people are coming over here. Someone will get stuck here. And more often than not, they'll actually find their own way out of the building because, they, you know, what? I can go down the road and do, behave the way I am. And that won't make them wrong. It just makes them wrong for our business now that we're going in this direction. Well, mate, yeah, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication and we're dealing with very complex problems here. We're talking... I suppose um, some people might be sitting there listening, thinking we're talking very glibly about what is a really complex set of problems. Um, but this framework, I, I love it because I, um, I, I sort of, it, it resonates with me because I've spent time in the sporting world and I've spent time trying to run sales teams and I've never been able to get any sort of cohesion with a sales department primarily because of this, this dysfunction between mechanics and dynamics. So I think it's brilliant. I absolutely love it. And I recommend anybody that's, um, that's watching or listening to this to, um, to reach out to Daniel and the guys at Leading Teams because I think um, if, that, if some of that can't help you, what's on the screen right now, then, then something's wrong. Um, yeah, but look, um, I'd like to explore this a little bit further, Daniel, in, in perhaps another interview or two. So are you up for another one perhaps next week? Yeah, let's do it. It'll be good. Look forward to it. All right. Awesome. Well, let's, let's leave it there for now. And um, yeah, thanks again for your time. That's a, it's an amazing model and a lot of, lot of um, thought provoking ideas there, but let's talk again next week. Thanks, mate. Look forward to it. Cheers, Daniel.